Welcome everybody. Nice to see you guys. Uh, we have a nice Zoom crowd tonight, which is lovely. Um, Shlomit Ovadia, have we ever met? You have to unmute. Oh, yeah, I have it on mute. I'm in Nicaragua and where I am right now is very loud, but we okay. have met. Um, I went to like a shiur that you did at the den a few weeks ago. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We missed you last yeah. night. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Welcome. Okay. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, we're here to um, talk about some themes in the Haggadah and um, to, to give you um, some uh, questions to ask uh, at the Seder. Um, and you also have the answers. Uh, to the questions we'll ask at the Seder. Um, everyone's Seder is different, but it's always good to have uh, some things to discuss uh, and talk about uh, at the Seder. So we're going to jump right in. This is a, a, a lengthy document that I have. Every year I add a few more things. Um, I think it's called Haggadah Tidbit um, that I that I um, add. and that. Uh, so we're going to do the new ones for, uh, for this year. So... Uh, we'll start with um, sort of a fundamental qu question. Um, uh, for those of you sitting here, it's on page six. It says, what does Pesach mean? So that's a sort of a fundamental question. The holiday is called Pesach. And uh, in English, we call it Passover. And we'll get to, to why. Uh, we're also going to discuss some other meanings of Pesach, which help us um, to appreciate some under, other themes of Pesach and other, other messages that Pesach may uh, may bring. So the notion of um, of Pesach being uh, the Passover, right? That comes from the idea that when God was um, killing the firstborn Mitzrim Egyptians, um, we had put blood on our doorposts, right? And uh, that was a sign that it was a Jewish home, and God passed over those houses, right? That's what the pasuk says here. V'yamartam zevach Pesach hu lahashem. From Shemot Yudbet, you shall say it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord. Why? Asher pasach al batei bnei Yisrael that God um, that God passed over, as we see the translation here, the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. Binagfo et Mitzrayim when he uh, smote the Egyptians, that batenu he'd seal, but he saved our houses, the people then bowed in homage. So this pasuk is understood by Rashi and others uh, in terms of explaining the word pasach, that God so jumped over the houses of the Jews or the malach amavet, God's, uh, God's emissary that night, uh, passed over the houses of the Jews, and uh, and we and we survived. That is um, one very well-known explanation of the word Pesach. But I'd like to share, um, well, let me let me uh, stop by asking a question. Has anyone ever heard of a different meaning of the word Pesach, other than God passing over uh, our homes? Like Pesach, like the mouth speaks? Ah, Pesach, okay, great. That's the, the mouth speaks. So what happened that night? Um, uh, in turn, how, how would that fit into what happened, like this pasuk that night? You think? I don't know, but I guess my that works well when you're speak saying over the Haggadah, <clears throat> right? That you're supposed to talk right. about. Right, that's true. That's that's very true, and I mean it's a it's very important, right? One of the fundamental differences between a slave and a free person is the ability to speak freely. Right. So that so the notion of, of splitting the word Pesach into two words, Pesach, the mouth that speaks, uh, is um, is very important in terms of understanding uh, one of the uh, fundamental differences between a free person and a slave. A slave actually has, has a voice, but they, their voice doesn't matter. Right. Um, I was just thinking about this also in connection with this week's Parsha as we start uh, Sefer Vayikra. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but essentially the avoda that took place in the Beit HaMikdash on any, in any given time, whenever carbonate were brought, 
Um, the Kohanim didn't speak. There was like no speaking part for the Kohen. The, if you were bringing a sin offering, so the, the person who brought the sin offering put their hands on the animal and they admitted their sin. But the Kohen who then did all the rituals with the animal didn't speak. In fact, there's a Jewish um, a scholar, um, Kaufman, I think is his last name, who actually um, termed the Beit HaMikdash and the Mishkan the sanctuary of silence. I guess the only thing you heard were animals being killed or animals being brought in before they're going to be killed. Like the Kohanim didn't speak. So it's very interesting to contrast that with the notion of, of, of Pesach. And Joe's point actually goes even further, right? Because the, the whole night of Pesach is about speaking, right? The whole mitzvah is Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim. You have to tell the story. And you don't fulfill the story of Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim by just remembering it. You actually have to say it out loud. Pesach, matzah, maror. So the notion of Pesach is uh, is very important. Okay, anyone, any other um, understandings, explanations of the word Pesach, other than the mouth that speaks or this notion of passing over? Sarah, did you want to say something? Sorry, I didn't realize it was off mute. That's okay. All right. So let's look at this. Um, I came across a really interesting uh, explanation in a book called Kerem Lishlomo, um, written by Mordechai Greenberg. Um, I don't know who Mordechai Greenberg is, but he is from Yeshivat Kerem Biyavne. And uh, for those of you who have the sheet in front of you, it's on page eight, the page labeled eight. And um, we're going to um, read it in Hebrew. I will translate it as we go. Um, if you have a pen uh, or a pencil, you want to take some notes as we go to, um, and if you want me to send you this document, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll put this document right now, the link to this document in the chat. Um, so that way, anyone on Zoom could, if they want to, um, open the document and um, and print it out if they want to have it uh, in their own, in their possession or use it at the Seder, we'll be able to print it. All right, just put it in the chat and you can print it if you want. Okay, so um, here we go. HaPerush HaMekubal Hashem Pesach Hu Shakadosh Baruch Hu B'Darko LaHaroget B'Kurei Mitzrayim Mitzrayim. So as we said, the accepted explanation of Pesach is God uh, on his way to kill the Egyptian firstborn Delayed me'al bate b'nei Yisrael v'lo hargam. He skipped over the the homes of the Jews and did not kill them. V'al neis ha'atzalah nikra ha'chag hazeh b'shem Pesach. And because of that miracle, because God uh, God Pasach, God passed over, we call the holiday Pesach. Al shem ha'pesicha v'hadilug me'al bate b'nei Yisrael uh, to commemorate or to to name the holiday after the skipping over of the Jewish homes. Shelo shahab v'etam, that God did not spend any time there. She'ilo ya nechnas l'vetam, ha'ita ha'maka mit cholalim gamalem, that had God entered, then the Jews would have been subject to the plague as well. L'peirus zeh, anu m'shadchim l'kadosh baruchu, al shelo paga b'bechoreinu b'sha'ashu ha'kika et b'kore mitzrayim. So this peirush, uh, focuses us on Thanksgiving, which is a central theme of Pesach. Um, you know, we have two mitzvot regarding um, Yitzit Mitzrayim. We have Zecher Yitzit Mitzrayim, the obligation, which is a daily obligation, right, to remember the Exodus of Egypt. We fulfill that mitzvah. One way to fulfill that mitzvah is the third paragraph of Shema, right, so that we could do that. Otherwise, sometimes they're Tukim. But there's a daily obligation to remember the Shema Shem and then there's the yearly obligation to tell the story of the Shema Shem The question is, what's the difference practically between them? So one of the differences is when it comes to Sipur Yitzhak Shem the mitzvah that we're going to fulfill at the Seder table, one of the elements that has to be there is there has to be um, an expression of gratitude. That's part of it, which is not necessary for the daily myths of remembering. The daily myths of remembering, we were slaves, God freed us, 
you don't have to also express gratitude. When it comes to the Seder night, we're obligated to express gratitude. That's why it says at the end of the Haggadah, right, that whole thing. Therefore, we are obligated to thank God because that's part of the mitzvah. So that is, that's, that comes from the word Pesach that God passed over. However, the author here is going to offer another really interesting, I think, inspirational idea. Ulam, second paragraph. Perush ze eno mechuvar. This explanation doesn't really make sense. So he's not only going to offer a new one, he's going to challenge the original one. Don't tell your kids because this is what they learn in school. And we don't want to, uh, we don't want to tell them that there's no Santa, right? We just want them to appreciate <laughs> that this is the, uh, the, the main the meaning of Pesach and it's true, but he's going to offer another one. If God was the one who skipped from house to house, as it says in the Haggadah, that I did this and not an angel, I did this and not an emissary, how do we explain the verse in Shemot chapter 12 that says God did not allow the mashit, some angel of death, right, to enter the homes. According to the Torah, it sounds like it was not God, but it was someone else, something else. According to the Haggadah, the Haggadah insists, Ani, the lo shaliach, God, me, and not a shaliach. So what he's suggesting is this whole idea that God passed over we're not so sure who passed over. Was it God? Was it Shaliyah? We're not sure. Then he quotes Rav Cook uh, to offer a different explanation. Parshanut mechudeshet umaftia matzia Rav Cook zatzal bidirashotam. He says a surprising and new explanation was suggested by Rav Cook. Kasheritiach Eliyahu b'fnei nuvei habal ad matai atem psachim. Al So you see the word in there, the fourth word. We're right here on the bottom of the page. The fourth word in the sent in that sentence is psachim. Mm-hmm. So when the Jewish people during the time of Eliyahu, they were um they were playing, they were, they were playing both sides of the fence. They were worshiping God and they were worshiping Baal. And Eliyahu said, How long are you going to psachim al sifim? How long are you going to be standing on both sides? Like, pick a side. You're either a pagan or you're a monotheist, right? You either, either you serve God or you serve Baal. So the word Psachim here, which is Pesach, ein ha-perush shehem dilgum aleihem. Eliyahu is not saying that the Jewish people jumped over any of the gods. Ela shehem nachu aleihem. They rested with each god. Right? The Jewish people at that point were worshiping both. So here, Rav Cook is suggesting that the word Pesach doesn't mean to skip. It actually means the opposite. It means to, st- to stay or to, to stand with something. Sometimes the Jews were on the side of Baal, and sometimes the Jews were on the side of God. Also, the Pasuk in Shira Shirim that says um, God jumps uh, on the mountains. It's like jumping from one mountaintop to the uh, to the other mountaintop. It's not um, skipping, you're actually landing on it a little bit before you move on to the other. Right? You're on one mountaintop, then you jump to the other one. We're on the third line of the page here. So similarly, when it comes to Makat B'chorot, the explanation is not that God jumped or skipped B'nai Yisrael, Hainu she'avar aleihem b'dilugo, that God skipped our homes, Ela lehefech, shenach al habatim. This is so beautiful. 
What did God do that night of Makat Bechorot? He came into our houses, right? Who was jumping around? The Mashchit was jumping around. But who was Poseach? Who was, who was whatever that means, in our case now, going into our homes? God. Now, presumably, why was it going into our homes? To protect us against the Mashchit. Oh, wow. And so now we have a whole other picture of what's going on, right? God, each Jewish home had the presence of God in there. And when that loud knock on the door came, right, God was there to not let the mashchit in. Rav Kook is saying there's even a bigger chidush. That Mitzrayim was such a place full of tuma, full of <coughs> impurity, that God didn't want to be there. Which is why Moshe said, when I leave Egypt, I'll be able to pray to God, because God's not here. This is a godless place. But God made an exception on that night and allowed himself to enter into Mitzrayim. Zehu shed gishah Torah. This is what the Torah means. It emphasizes that God pasach, which now we mean, now we're understanding to mean went in. Usually God's presence is in a special place, like the Beit HaMikdash or the Mishkan, not in someone's house. The Kosha came Tuman. Certainly, God doesn't like to be in Tumah. He locks himself away. To turn every house, actually, into a sanctuary. Why? Normally, a carbon can only be brought in Beit HaMikdash or the Mishkan. But the Jews were told to bring a carbon in their house. So by God entering into their house, he turned it in to a Beit HaMikdash. That's why they were able to do the carbon Pesach. Right? Since there was so much tuma, actually God had to come in. To sort of cleanse it and to put his presence there. To give it the, uh, the sanctity. So, um, let's just read this last paragraph. God's presence is what is what prevented the mashchit, the angel of death, from coming into their houses. That's what saved Bnei Israel. And the pasuk that says, "And I went through Mitzrayim and killed all the firstborn." And the fact that the, the Midrash says, Chazal say, I did it and not anyone else. That's talking, right? Who went in to Bnei Yisrael's homes and not an emissary? God, right? Mm-hmm. But the actual slaying of the Egyptian firstborn, that was done through a shaliach. The payers de ikar ho da'ahi al shirat hashchina b'atei Yisrael. So now it's true. We're still thanking God. We're thanking God for something entirely different. Not thanking God for skipping us. Actually, thanking God for doing the opposite. Thanking God for coming into our houses and saving us. Right? It's a beautiful idea. If we think about like what's happening on Pesach night, it's the anniversary, right, of that night uh, when God allowed His presence to risk whatever that means, his presence to be sullied by the impurity of Egypt in order to take care, in order to take care of us. So Pesach, again, don't destroy for your kids, don't talk about God passing over, but for the adults at the table, right, Pesach now has a, a and it's, it's, it could be a very um, powerful and empowering and, and uh, redemptive idea that God, you know, comes into our life even though it may not be the neatest thing, even though, you know, maybe we don't feel that we deserve God in our life or whatever, whatever the case may be, right? God comes into our life. That's what it means. That's what it means here. So 
a totally different, a, a sort of a, it's a 180 of what the word Pesach means, um, but it leaves us with a beautiful message of what we're being thankful for uh, that God uh, that God entered into our house. Okay, I'm gonna stop there for a moment and see if there are any comments or questions. For those of you who came on a little bit late, we're looking at different meanings of the word Pesach. The first one was the traditional one that God passed over our homes. And this one um, is quite different. It says the opposite, that God didn't pass over the homes of B'nai Israel, but based on the, on the Pasuk um, that we quoted um, in Melachim Aleph, that uh, Pesach means to, to stand on or to be with. And so God stood with us and was with us in our home. We'll get to another one in a minute, uh, uh, but I'm, I just want to stop to have any comments or questions so far. Just for those of you who are not here in person, you are missing homemade cookies. <laughs> and um, so maybe next time. Okay, but on Pesach, I don't think we're going to have class. Okay, um, I want to look at another meaning of the word Pesach. Um, which um, we'll start with this Pasuk in uh, Yeshayahu, in Isaiah. We have the word, the root, Pe Samachet, appearing again. Um, I'm going to just make this bigger because I'm having trouble reading it. Okay, here's what the Pasuk says. Uh, like the birds that fly, even so will the Lord shield Yerushalayim, shielding and saving, protecting and rescuing. So this is a pasuk that um, explains that God protects us like a bird uh, like a bird. We're going to see what that means in the Midrash in a moment, but you see the second to the last word in the line is Pasoach, right, which is uh, the same root as the word Pesach. And that means of Hitzil Pasoach Vihimlit, protecting, saving, protecting, and rescuing. So here we see the word Pasoach, again, with the same root as Pesach, meaning to protect. We're going to share a couple of really neat Midrashim um, on that. One from the Mechilta. Davar acher al kanfein nesharim derech of lihiot maniach banav ben berkav. How does um, a bird normally protect its young or carry its young? He holds the young in in its feet or between its knees. Mipnei shemit yarei mipnei ma mi shechazak mimenu. That most birds are afraid that a stronger bird that flies higher will harm them, right? So they hold their bird underneath their body and shield their bo- their baby with their body. Aval, I mean, aval nesher, which is um, an eagle or something like that. There is no bird that flies higher than an eagle. Minichin al They put their baby on their back. All they are afraid of is an arrow coming from earth, from the ground. There's no bird that's gonna overtake them in terms of height. So they put their kid on their back. They're only afraid of what's coming from the bottom. Therefore they create a wall they serve, right? Because now they're going to be the ones who are going to take the the brunt of the attack. And they serve as this protection between themselves and their and their babies. That's what God did. He he made the Malachi Hasharit become sort of a mechitza, a fence, a boundary between the Jewish people and Mitzrayim. Shemar Vayisa Malachi Elokim. That uh, this Malach Elokim went with them and protected B'nai Yisrael. So we see the word Pasoach has the language of protecting. If we go now to 
number seven, where this theme sort of continues. Um, this is a good, so, so if you want to share this at your Seder, this is on page 16 in the packet. If I share this in your Seder, you could share this either as a question of what Pesach really means, or we're going to look at another sort of wordplay. The word, has, the word, um, the mitzvah of Hesteba, right? That's the mitzvah of leaning at the Seder, okay? So what does that word mean? So if you look um, on the bottom of the page, and right here on the screen, Vayasev Elohim et ha'am, derech ha'midbar yamsuf, v'chamushim alu b'nei shomim et so God led the people round about by way of the wilderness at the Sea of Reeds. So Vayisav here means, the translation is that God took them in a roundabout way, right? right? That's, the, the, that's Vayisav. However, Vayisav can also mean something else according to the Midrash. And that's the Midrash we have in Shemot Rabbah on the bottom of 16 and continuing on 17. Really, an amazing midrash. What does this mean that God, Vayisav Elohim, that God did this? So, again, most well known explanation is that God took them in a roundabout way so they wouldn't encounter any hostile nations early on. But the midrash says, Mahu Vayisav, Shekifana Kadosh Baruchu, that God surrounded them, presumably with the clouds of glory. Kishem Shahu Omer, Vani Eye, Lashem. It's talking about, um, and I think I have the English of this midrash if you want to look at it. On page, yeah, I have this English on page 17. Uh, compared to a shepherd who was shepherding their sheep, and um, so they wouldn't get uh, hurt. All the nations were there trying to figure out how they could attack B'nai Yisrael. When God saw this, that God surrounded them. So we don't have to read anymore. So what's the connection to Hasebah? Normally we think Hasebah, the leaning, Comes from the comes from the root shave, like you could you you could switch out the samach and the shin. They're maybe they're interchangeable because they have that similar sound. Shave, save, right? So, seva is from the word shave to sit in a in a unique way. But the midrash is saying no. By save means to protect. So when we lean, we're commemorating, not because normally we say save is to commemorate that we are free. Right, a, uh, that's the way a wealthy person eats. Right, they, they lean back, they put their feet up. We don't do that anymore, but back in the day. According to this midrash, there's a different meaning of Hasteva. It's to commemorate God's protecting us. Right, because it has the same root. Hasteva, Vayasev, is the same root. And Vayasev, according to this midrash, doesn't mean that God took us around in circles. It means that he circled us. He encircled us and protected us. That goes back to that other meaning of the word Pesach, right? We go back now to the beginning of the source sheet. I know we're jumping around a lot. That goes back to the meaning of the word uh, Pesach, that uh, additional meaning of uh, like the, the, the bird that is Hitzil Pasoach Vimlit, right? Just the eagle protects the, the child. So, so now we have another meaning of the word Pesach, right? So now we have Passover. Mm -hmm. We have stay with, like come into our home. And Pesach could also mean to protect, which is, which is similar to the notion of coming into the home, but we see it now taught in a different way through the Midrash of God taking us through, um, uh, taking us through the desert and the connection to the mitzvah of, of Hasebo. So it's a nice idea to share about what, either about um, the mitzvah of, of leaning or, uh, you know, if over the course of the Seder, you want to, sprinkle in different meanings of the word Pesach. Now we have a few different, and there are others, but we're going to stop on, on this topic now, of what the word uh, Pesach actually actually means. Is there a connection between like the physical act of leaning and the idea of protecting? I was trying to think about that. Um, 
I don't know. I wasn't able to come up with one unless like you, you want to say it's like, like you would, you would lean over to cover. Right. Like I remember, I, I think I mentioned this. Uh, I remember my father, I love I don't know if you've ever had this experience driving with a parent. I used to go, <laughs> I used to go working. I used to go to work with my father a lot. Um, and his job, uh, he was a, a salesman for a Spanish food company. So he used to go to a lot of supermarkets and take the inventory of what they had and then try to convince them to buy more inventory, okay? But so he would drive a lot uh, in New York. And from time to time, when he would stop short, I was always wearing a seatbelt, but he would always do that. Yeah. Like, uh, right, he would, if you can't see me on the screen, like he would put his hand, like that's gonna, like if we get into an, a, a, a car accident, that, that's not gonna really keep me from going through the windshield. I don't know, but that was his like instinct um to you know protect me so maybe Haseba that's actually a nice idea like you're leaning over like you're going to take the bullet you're going to protect like uh you know it starts to rain and you have a kid in the carriage and there's no plastic thing so you you know you cover the carriage or mm -hmm. you put your kid under your coat or whatever we do to protect people we love uh usually it, it usually it often involves sort of comporting our body yeah. in a way which is not natural to uh, get in front of or uh, or above, like the bird, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, yeah, so maybe that, maybe that's, I haven't thought about it until you asked the question, but that's a really nice, it's a very, um, we just got this new Haggadah, which I haven't opened yet. It's called a traditional and radical Haggadah in four voices. And it's, it basically um, talks about um, four different themes in the Haggadah. And one of them is embodiment. It's a very physical holiday. Yeah. So this is another element of that embodiment. We, we, we relive God protecting us by leaning over us, by maybe ourselves leaning. Yeah. Um, nice. And also, you're, um, you're very relaxed. So when you're safe and you feel protected, you're also... Yeah. Like, oh, oh, that's very nice. Oh, so we're not, we're not enacting the protection. We're enacting the result of the protection. Yeah. So it's not about wealth. And it's about feeling safe. That's very nice. That's a beautiful idea, right? And that's also, what it also um, dovetails very well with the notion of Leil Shimurim, right? Um, Pesach is called uh, Leil Shimurim, the night of, of being protected. So it's customary not to say Kriyat Shema Al Hamita. Have you ever heard that? On Leil Seder, people don't say the nighttime Shema, which is there to protect us, because this, this is Leil Shimurim. We're in. We leave our door unlocked, mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, it's Lel Shimurim. We're protected. Um, so that also works nicely. Um, Andrea has a, um, a note here. I like this idea. It fits in well with mezuzahs that we put on our doorpost. Exactly. Right. Um, also as, a, as an element of, uh, of protection. Not only that, actually, I'm not sure what, which element you were talking about, Andrea, the notion of the mezuzah actually fits in with a couple of these ideas, right? Because if Pesach means that God stepped into our homes, right, that's what the mezuzah symbolizes, that this is a, a Jewish place, this is a godly place. Mm -hmm. So the mezuzah symbolizes two elements of what Pesach means. One, well, first of all, it symbolizes the traditional understanding, because the Israel will have to put the blood on their doorpost. So that's the mezuzah. It symbolizes the second notion that God is with us because that's what this, the mezuzah would symbolize in our home. And it symbolizes the idea of Pesach, meaning protection like the bird, uh, because the mezuzah offers that element uh, element as well. So excellent, uh, excellent point, Andrew. Okay, great. Um, that was a lot about the word Pesach. Um, let's do uh, some quick hits now. Two more quick hits before we say goodnight. Um, on page 12, Uh, actually start with uh, page um, 10. And I'll ask a question, and anyone could answer this question, whether you're in Zoom or in person. Why do we eat matzah? I guess the theme of this night is undoing the myths of third grade, <laughs> right? Um, so why do we eat matzah at the Seder? Because we rushed out. Exactly. Okay. That's what you have in uh, number five on page uh, on page ten, and that's what we say at the seder. 
there are the um, Rabbi Shimon and Gamliel. We have a, we have a, a, a section at uh, at the seder towards the end of Magid, which uh, may be one of the most important parts of the seder, where we say as follows: Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel Amar, Kol Shelo Amar Shlosha Devarim Elu Lo Yatsa Yedei Right? Remember that anyone who has not said these three things has not fulfilled their mitzvah. Likely that means they have not fulfilled the mitzvah of retelling the story of Pesach, which is the whole point that we're at the table to begin with, okay? Those three things are Pesach, the carbon Pesach, the Paschal sacrifice, Matzah, why we eat Matzah, and Mara, why we eat Mara. So here's what, uh, on, on the page, this is what the Matzah symbolizes. We eat matzah um, because we took out dough, but we didn't have time to let it rise. So we took it out and then it baked in the sun and boom, it was matzah. There's one small problem with this explanation of why we eat matzah. It's not true. Uh -oh. Not true. Anyone know why it's not true? Except for Paul Fishman, who may have heard me say this at the Devar Torah earlier this evening. Anyone know why it's not true? It's not true because if you read Sefer Shemot, Perak Yud Bet, Pasuk 8, we are told, God says, bottom of page 10, God tells Moshe, this is the first of the, this is the, first of the months, right? Nisan, by the way, it's Rosh Chodesh today. Good Chodesh, everybody. To be a chodesh of redemption, right? Mm -hmm. the, the Gemara says, "Bachodesh nisan nigalu, ubenisan atidin lihigael." Right? We will we were redeemed in Nissan, and we will be redeemed in the future. So we should all have whatever redemptions we need in this month of Nissan, personal and national. Okay. So God says it's Rosh Chodesh Nissan. That's great. And um, on the tenth, you should bring the carbon, and then. The blood on your doorpost, and then on we're now on page twelve, and you're going. To, you shall keep watch over it, meaning you should watch over this animal until the fourteenth, and then you are going to put some of it on your doorpost, and then v'achlu et habasar balayla hazeh sliesh umatzot. You will eat it that night with matzah and mara. So even before we left Mitzrayim, God tells us to eat eat matzah. What's going on in the in the Magid in the Haggadah? We said, well, we eat matzah because we left Mitzrayim in a hurry, but here. We eat matzah because God told us to eat matzah the night before we left Mitzrayim. So, we have a problem. Any suggestions? Would the real reason for matzah please stand up? Uh -huh. Maybe they got the idea of matzah from that night and they were like, this is easy. We do this on the way out. Okay. Interesting, but why did God tell him to eat matzah on that night? Why not just say, bake some challah, mm. right? Have some bread. They, they weren't in a hurry that night. They know where to go. They weren't allowed to go anywhere. That's why they had to stay in their house because the Malach HaMavas was doing his thing. You didn't want them to have leftovers. Ah, interesting. Okay. So, but that, that that's an interesting solution. But the problem with that solution is that it sounds like when they left Mitzrayim, they baked fresh matzah, right? According to the, the Haggadah text, which I'll scroll back to, the Gada text says, when they left Mitzrayim, they didn't have time for their bread to rise. So it looks like they made fresh dough when they were leaving Mitzrayim, which they had planned on letting rise. And then God said, well, sorry, gang, it's time to leave. Just take whatever you have and we'll make, the, we'll make do. So I like the leftover idea. It's very, um, very good for the environment and the wallet. I love it. But it doesn't, necessarily jive with the, these two accounts. But there, by the way, I, I, I think the leftover idea is on the right track in another way, which we're gonna see in a moment. Any other suggestions? 
what is going on here? Right? It's, it's a question we don't always think about, but when you now when you juxtapose these two sources, it seems like an obvious question. Dramatize. The, the experience, the story, so that the kids ask the questions. I mean, it's almost like a simplified story. Okay, so that, that is very interesting. Suggesting, so you're suggesting, I think, without saying it, that we're telling a story which isn't entirely true for the sake of... Right. So there's value in that and a danger in that, right? We don't want to... There's, there's value in dramatizing things, there's value in adding details, that's what a midrash does. But there's also a danger, because here we seem to be explicitly going against a verse, a series of verses in the Torah, but that's a fascinating idea that um, both happened, and so that's the one we tell, because that's the one which is going to engender maybe more excitement. Okay, that's uh, the that's an excellent answer. Um, I think the the only thing I would think about in that answer is that, um, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great answer, and that's very much within the theme of the seder, because the theme of the seder is uh, trying to make sure that we do things in a way that keep the children asking questions. Okay, excellent. I'll share an answer with you um, from the Abu Draham who's a medieval commentary, mostly well-known for his commentary on the Sidur, um, but uh, he also has a commentary on the Haggadah. I'll blow this up a little bit. Okay, so it's on the screen for those of you who are on screen, and it's on page 12 for those of you with the text in front of them. He quotes the section of the Haggadah we just talked about, and he says, Yesh this is the question, the reason the commandment to eat matzah was not because the Jewish people did not have time to let their bread rise. That's not the reason, as we saw. Before that, in the Pesukim that we saw, B'nai Yisrael were told to eat matzah with no reason given. All God says is, eat the carbon pass up with matzah and mara, and he gives no reason. So Rabbi Yosef Kimchi gives an answer. Rabbi Yosef Kimchi is the father of the Radak. The Radak is another medieval commentary on the Chumash. This is his father. Okay? Um, his father says as follows. Shemash al ha-matzot kodem lachen haya al shem ha-atid. This is so cool. This notion that God told us to eat matzot the night before with the carbon Pesach is al shame to foreshadow or to consider the future. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. you're going to eat this stuff again, and because that's when you're leaving, and that's when that's when the symbol is going to be attached to it. We're eating it now to think about how life is going to be in the future. God who knows the future knew that they were going to leave Egypt and he knew that they were not going to have time. Even if they wanted to let their bread rise, he, their, their dough, he knew they wouldn't have time. Top of the left column. Even if they wanted to, they wouldn't have time for their bread to rise. So, and God, because of the future, told them to eat the matzah that night and for the next seven days. So this is a very nice answer. Uh, it explains the psukim and explains the contradiction between the psukim and the text of the Haggadah. Also, I also think it gives us another idea to think about, which is we have the ability, or God is telling B'nai Israel here, that you have the ability to think about the future, which also a slave never does. Right? The slave it's just a day-to-day -day existence. Just got to get through this day, right? Those of us who are not slaves, we plan ahead. 
Slaves can't plan ahead. They could maybe dream about being free, but they're not making plans, right? Free people make plans. So that's what's going on here, right? God is, is teaching us, right, that one of the things we should be thankful for at, at the Seder night, and in general, one of the things we should consider is the future, right? We, 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 we don't just live like, I guess, like animals live in the moment, right? We should not just live in the moment. We should envision what we want the future to look like and then try to get there, right? Try to take steps to get there. That's what God's teaching B'nai Israel. You're Tonight, you're slaves. But this matzah that you're eating, that's for generations going to symbolize your freedom. What freedom? You'll see tomorrow. You could do it. You just think you could envision it. You'll see, believe me, there's a future. You're not going to be here very much longer. That's what it means, al Um, That explains this contradiction between what's going on in the Haggadah and what's going on in, um, in the Pesukim. Okay. Um, you ever see that type of concept anywhere else? Like, where they're fighting with people right like that? Like yeah, that, right? I, I think it's I think it's fundamental to the belief in Mashiach. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. Right, that um, we never believe that we've achieved our best. I think tshuva is fundamentally about right. Repentance is fundamentally about belief, and that's the best example. Right? Believing that we could be different and then taking steps to make that that happen. Can you? Are there any others that you're thinking of? Right. God told us we were on our way. Right. Um, yeah. There are examples of this. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think it really uh, weaves its way through through a lot of uh, of Jewish life and Jewish thought. This notion. Of um, of the future, right? Mashiach, like we said, tshuva. Um, I mean, look, another great example. What do we say at, at a bris or a baby naming? The kid is eight days old, and we're already talking about their wedding, right? Because that's that's the way we operate. We always operate. I mean, Salvatic has this beautiful essay where he talks about Jews operate in three time zones, the present, the past, and the future, right? So much of what we do is to remember the past, but we remember the past because so in order to build, actually he says differently, we never act, Jews never live in the present. We're always either remembering or aspiring, right? And that's what's going on here. We, we remember in order to aspire. And we remember the, 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 the slavery in order to aspire to be free. We remember, um, being uh, being enslaved in order to uh, inspire redemption. So that's how that's how a Jew lives. So it's it's fundamental. Yeah. Okay. Um, one other quick, one other tiny point. Question. One other tiny point. Uh, page seventeen. This is from a wonderful sefer. Name I forgot, but the rabbi is D David Shapiro. He I, I mentioned him last Shabbos. He was a rabbi, in, I think, in Milwaukee in the fifties and the sixties. An American rabbi. There's this beautiful idea about Shabbat Haggadot. Um, and it's a, it's a nice thought to end on. Shabbat Haggadot Nikra Kain Al Shem Hanes Haggadot Shikra Cheshbo Kimuar Betosbo Shabbat. There's a miracle. Why do we call it Shabbat Haggadot? Because it happened to have been on a Shabbat that the Jewish people took the carbon to slaughter, and the Mitrim who, who would worship the animals asked the Jews, What are you doing with them? And the Jews said, We're going to kill it. And the Egyptians didn't start up with them. That's one of the explanations of what Shabbat Haggadol is about and why we celebrate it. Okay. Why do we have a Shabbat? Why not just celebrate the day? It was the 10th. It was the 10th of Nisan. So it's interesting, which happened to be the Shabbat that day. That's our tradition. So this is strange. Most Jewish holidays are set on the date, not the day. Like we don't celebrate Pesach, we don't celebrate Purim on the on the third Tuesday because Haman's decree that year fell out on a Tuesday. We just do the date, except for this, except for this. Shabbos, we, we know the date, it was the 10th of Nisan, which was a Shabbos. So we always choose the Shabbos before Pesach instead of the 10th of Nisan. And we're not going to answer his question. That's for another time. We're going to get to another point. 
He says, second paragraph, Yitziat Mitzrayim, Cholala Ma'afecha Kivira B'chaye Ha'am. The exodus from Egypt created a, a gigantic upheaval, revolution in the, in the lives of the Jewish people. Am shehaya bazuz v'shasui murdaf belich hashach, moshach, evet mushlim, right, the Jewish people who were, who were downtrodden and oppressed and enslaved, yatsa pitom l'chirut olam, like in a, in a flash, like for hundreds of years they're slaves, and now in a minute they walk out of Egypt and all of a sudden they're free. The Jewish people, as we said earlier, who were stuck in this 49th um, level of impurity. Uh, and the Gemara says, It's amazing. The Gemara says about what was going on in Egypt. They, the Egyptians, were worshipping idols. And they, the Jews, were worshipping idols. It was a bad scene, according to Chazal. Vis a vis what we what we were like. Zacha, but what, what happened? Zacha Bachamishim Yom in just 50 days, Achard say to me shafel of Mishafel of Odato, La Amod Bitachitar Sinai. Just 50 days later, after being in this terrible condition, slaves and idolaters, 50 days later, we stood at Har Sinai, Lishmoa Kola Lokim, hearing God's voice, Midaber Mitocha Esh. And we heard God's voice and we survived. There's a message there, which I think is similar to the previous idea. You could envision the future, right? This is envisioning the future in like an like a really intense way. It's a total 180, a total change. But not only that, it could be quick, right? There, there is the human capacity. Now, it, 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 may, it might not always be healthy, to do it quickly. Sometimes it's better to do it slowly, but it is possible in a, in a moment, right, to uh, to change. Sometimes that happens when you have a, a sort of experience and because of that one experience, you change your whole outlook on life. It was a split second. In a million years, you wouldn't have thought that way beforehand, but something happens and we change. So we have to like, be open to those moments uh, where that change. Now, sometimes change is slow, but sometimes change is quick and we have to, um, like I said, try to be spiritually attuned to those possibilities. There's a Gemara, which we're not going to read. You can read it on your own, about a Zara. Um, a couple of times, the, 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 the punchline of the Gemara, though I'll read to you, which is, Yatstab bat kol v'amra, Rabbi Chanina ben Tradion, v'kal saturniri muzmanin heim l'chel Bacha Rabbi, this is the last page. Bamar, Yesh Kone Olamo Bisha'a Achat. Someone could acquire their share in the world to come in a moment. Right? In this case, this guy lives a terrible life. He was an executioner for the Romans, and he did something a little, a little, a little compassionate, and God says he's immediately invited to the Olam Abba. So this notion again, right? Yesh Kone Olamo Bisha'a Achat. Sometimes you could acquire your share in the world to come, change your life just in a split second. Other times, it takes many years. The end of the Gemara is, sometimes it takes a long time. Both of them are legitimate. and just depends on the situation. We keep ourselves open and attuned to what's going on in our life and use those moments uh, to uh, to inspire us. Um, that's uh, what Rabbi Soloveitchik says about events that are negative. He says, we never could explain why. There's no way to explain, God forbid, why someone has a sick child. There's no way to explain, God forbid, why someone gets into an accident. There's, any explanation is, is, um, is usually cruel. Mm. It usually does not help the person who's suffering. So Rabbi Salvation says, instead of wasting our time on that, we should, we should internalize the moment and use it as a moment of introspection. Because it's, these events shock us, and so it may be natural to do that. That's maybe what it means, yesh kone olamo. Okay, so those are your Haggadah tidbits uh, for this year. I hope that they bring uh, some um, thoughtful conversation uh, to your uh, Seder table, even if you don't remember the answers. The questions are great, and people will hopefully 
uh, come up with, uh, with their own answers. If anyone wants to review any of this with me um, and wants to just clarify, you can give me a call, send me a text, and I'm happy to uh, review it with you in a little private chavrusa. Um, this is a great pleasure. I'm sorry, I was gonna do this two weeks in a row, but it just occurred to me I'm out next week out of town, so we can't do this again. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, I think the Midrash says when Mashiach comes, all the Chagim are gonna be, um, we're not gonna celebrate them anymore except for Purim. So I was gonna say that hopefully we'll do this again next year, but I'm actually saying hopefully we won't do this again next year <laughs> because if we, that means Mashiach will come and all we'll be doing is Purim. Um, I don't know if that means we're going to be able to eat summits on Pesach after Mashiach comes. I'm not sure how that's going to work itself out. But uh, in any case, we should all have a Pesach where we feel God's presence in our homes, like B'nai Yisrael felt God's presence in their home in Mitzrayim. We should all feel the protection of God, uh, like the uh, baby uh, the baby eagle uh, feels the protection of its, uh, of its mommy. And uh, we should all be attuned to the opportunities in our life uh, to love more, to be closer to God, our family, and our community. Chag Kasher V'Sameach. I look forward to seeing you all on Shabbat or on Pesach or after Pesach on the street, whenever, whatever the case may be. Thanks for joining, everybody. Thanks, Rabbi Gamal. Don't forget, don't forget to sell your chametz. You've gotten, whether you're doing it with me or not, just sell it. You got in my form, fill it out, bring it over, and uh, very important. All right, all the best, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.